service tonight at 6, leadership meeting tomorrow at 7, the Acts class Thursday at 6. Don't forget those for our family camp. That's, what, a month away, if that. 
And there are registrations in the back for that. That's kind of crept up quickly on us. And we want to thank everyone who came out the other evening, Monday night, to help take down the garage. And uh, we had a good time helping Mr. Mavis. May thank you for allowing us to do that on your behalf. And thank you for the refrigerator, Mr. May. Uh, it has one item in it right now. It has one item. Keep it that way. Small bottle of grape juice. Keep it that way. That's left over. So it's. You're welcome. Thank you so much as well. Also, there's an announcement that was given us for Margie Ward's granddaughter, and her name is Brooke Mitchell, and there's a celebration today for her, and also a fundraiser for her. Long story short, let me see if I can read the information for you. So we're having a spaghetti dinner to help raise money for my trip. This is Brooke, this is Margie Ward's granddaughter writing this. For my trip to the National FCCLA Leadership Conference. We'll be holding the dinner June 9th, that's today, at the Hopedale Firehouse from 12 to 4. And so I think that's spaghetti. So if you're in the mood for spaghetti, just head on to the uh, well, Speaking of food, thank you, Lily, for making those brownies yesterday. They were delicious. I left two for God to finish off. Two in the house. I was not standing amazed, I was sitting amazed as I ate those, but I'm going to invite you now to stand amazed with me as something even greater than brownies. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that he loved us. Amen. Let's stand and let's go and appreciate our worship time as we bring our love and adoration to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loves us. <laughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned on me. How would I make my son to ever be? And I want to start with all this, my sin is not for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made it very old. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died on how This was written by the Apostle Paul, who you know was a violent opposer to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times in his writings after he came to Christ, he talked about the struggle that he had, I think, laying behind those things that were past because of the things he had done against the Lord. With that in mind, I want you to focus on what he says about the Lord's resurrection. When he says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and that he also appeared to the twelve. After that to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles. Last of all, now he's, now he's coming home with it, last of all. To me, one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I'm the least of the apostles, and I'm not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But, there's the proverbial but, but by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Let's pray. Father, to try to absorb that message from Paul to this church, this church that was laden with sin, even though they were Christians as they struggled with the sin issue. He's trying to get across, I believe, that if not for the grace of God, we would not be where we are right now. We would not be who we are right now. It's because of your doing that we are in Christ Jesus, he would tell them earlier in this book. So, Father, today, we pray that your grace toward us will not prove vain, but that we will labor more than all. Not us, but you. your grace will labor with us and through us and in us. In Jesus' name. If you would inquire about the Easter, help us out. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word of life. He came to die. So we be reconciled, came to rise to show us power and love. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our hands. That's why we have our hands in this game. That we gave
That's why we sing. That's why we offer in my hand. Yes, yes, that's why we sing. That's why we offer in my hand. That's why we Yes. 
Yes. Tom Lackey from Caddis. Say again. Tom Lackey from Caddis. Tom Lackey from Caddis. He's got a lot of medical problems. Okay, let's pray for Tom Lackey from Caddis. Me, uh, Bill, Larry, or their mom. Thank 
from Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raises us up with him and feeds us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. Paul mentions Christ four times. He mentions grace and love. And as you come to this table today, realize if it wasn't for the greatest love, his begotten Son, this table wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be in this room together today. To this love and grace of his son that was willing to die on the cross for us today to prepare this table, believe us, as we do it in remembrance of him of the great love and grace that God poured out upon this family in front of him. And as we go out into the world, just realize there's others that need to come to this table. Our names are already at that table in heaven. We're working on our eternity right now. 
We're not just working on today. And if we grow as Christians, invite others in. Because we are working on eternity. Even though we love this life dearly, this is just a blip of what the joy to come. So as we get prepared today to come up here and I ask blessing for the men to serve, and we partake of this, realize what the grace was that got us here in the first place. Jesus. Thank you. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from the land and wells laid. And sinners must be beneath that blood, lose all the guilty's ways. Lose all the Father, it's truly a blessing to be here today, to live in such a great country that I can come and worship you freely as I do. You've given me so many things. You've given me a, a great family, a great wife, but you also have given me a great church, and I do appreciate that. I see that not only, you know, like Monday night, it was practice what you preach, but I see it in everyone that's here. They're beginning to practice what they preach, or what you preach to us. But the greatest gift of all is your son. I realize that we're only here for a very short period of time, and we're invited into your story, and that we need to understand that we're just a little bit of a blimp in that story. But what's so great about it is, is you give us the opportunity to come and live with you in eternity. Bo talked about that love, and it is so great. You want each of us, even me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Uh, Heavenly Father, what an honor, what a privilege it is that we have the grace we meet in your house and praise your awesome grace. We want to thank you for all the wonderful things that you do for us in our everyday lives, the way you watch over us and bless us. And most of all, we want to thank you for your son who gave that ultimate sacrifice and died on that cross for our sins and rose up and shows the direction we need to go. As we come to this time of service to give back to you, let's give back with a very open heart. Bless those that can't give them. Bless those just as it's so fortunate you can't give. For this is in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Bode's communion meditation, how that all came together, that he put together Monday evening. And he was going between two passages. You didn't know I was preaching on grace. You did not know that the front of the bulletin would have a picture that was shown during the offering time that had the actual scripture from which you read. By grace you said it. You didn't tell me that. Got something going on bigger than us, folks. Amen. I love how the Holy Spirit brings our congregation closer to God and to each other. So where do you begin when you talk about God's grace? Well, I began in John chapter 8. This is one of the passages, and there's another one that I hope to mention before I close today, and that's from Matthew chapter 20, where it says the first will be last, and the last will be first. So I want you to happen to forget that before we pray today. Hey, Brother D, give us another couple minutes on that Matthew 20 passage, all right? Will anybody do that for me? Remind me. Thank you, Jeff. Goldie. <laughs> Goldie's going to go up there. Anyway. God's grace. This passage was my first sermon when I entered full-time ministry. I didn't know what I was going to preach on that particular Sunday in West Virginia where I was serving. But partway through the week, this passage is what came to mind. I preached it. The individual in the congregation, unfortunately, thought I was preaching right at her because she had had a similar experience in her life. But I try to emphasize to her that the forgiveness and grace of Jesus is what we were focusing on. It was not the condemnation. If you're not familiar with the account, it's in John 8, verse 1, where Jesus had gone to the Mount of Olives. It was early in the morning. And he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. I'm going to stop right there. Early in the morning. Now, Jesus knew it was coming, but we don't. And oftentimes, these type of situations will ruin the rest of the day for us. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, I don't need this this morning. Well, this is what they're bringing in him, and he handles it. And so we, we handle this well through him. They bring this woman caught in adultery. And having, her, having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. In the law of Moses, Moses commanded, us to stone such women. What then do you say? They're saying this testing him so that they might have grounds for accusation against him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and what he did? Wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who had put out sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down. What did he do? Wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one. Began with the old ones. He was left alone, and the woman, where she was, in the center of the court, straightening up. I see him standing tall now before this condemned woman. He says, "There, I see her still on the ground. I, I still see her scared." Woman, where I did no one accuse you. She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said, Let's read it together. I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin. I believe he said it was a smile. Grace. It's a great picture of God's grace. I don't know what he wrote the same. I wrote it up. I saw years ago, there's something you can order online. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's a little box. You can fill it with sand and put rocks in it. And when you're really stressed out, you run your fingers through it. It's supposed to soothe you. I don't need to order something like that, I think. But anyway, but when I go to the beach, there's a, the sand, the soothing feelings. I don't think he was distributing. I believe he was writing something, but I just don't know what it was. I don't know if he was writing other sins of which we are all guilty. I wondered if he was writing the names of the men that had been with her also in the same adulterous relationship and should have been there in the circle as well because Moses law didn't just say bring the woman, it also said bring the man when he is conspicuously absent from the scene. But it's a beautiful picture of grace. Charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, the Greek word for grace. 
If you see it in the Greek language, it would actually look like an X, an A with a little accent over it. It looks like the letter P, but it's pronounced with an R, and it looks like the letter I, and it looks like the letter S. So if you put X, A, and then what looks like a P, and then an I, what looks like an I, and an S, that's the actual Greek word for grace, charis. But in the English transliteration, it would be spelled C-H-A-R-I-S. Let me ask you, do you know anyone by the name of Charis? We do, because that's our second grandmother's name. Benjamin, son of the right hand, married Anna, ironically, and it's in the Bible as well, and their first daughter, they named Charis, from the Greek word meaning grace. The word carries the idea of having pleasure and having delight in someone else, a favorable regard toward others. Like God's favorable regard toward us when we depart this life and we stand in his presence and he says those words we long to hear, but we don't often believe we're actually going to hear them. Or we've been baptized. Yes, I've heard thousands of sermons on baptism. Here's one on grace. When you stand before him, those two long four words we long to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Last week we talked about biblical God honoring faith. To be full of faith is to be faithful. And so when we stand before God because of his grace, he will look at us and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things, I'll put you in charge of many. Enter into the what? Enter into the joy. Of your master. That's in Matthew chapter 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. The word grace, another aspect of all, also may be applied to the beauty of an individual or the gracefulness of that person of how they conduct themselves, maybe in a situation that isn't all that good. Here's a sentence to illustrate the use of the word grace. Even though the situation was appalling, they conducted themselves with dignity and with grace. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace, as they're seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how to respond to each person. It's kind of interesting when I go over my notes that I've already preached before, because very rarely will I ever <coughs> preach a sermon that I've preached before. I'll make notes, I'll write notes, I'll lay it out, and I'll preach it, and then maybe a week or two, maybe even a month later, I'll come across that, and I'll say, what in the world was I saying there? And I can't make catch their tails out of my notes at all, even though I'm the one that wrote them. So it's very rare for me to preach a message from notes that are in my heart. And I don't really have to look at them all the time, but it's very rare for me to do that. And even as I was reviewing these notes this week, I got to this particular part of the message where it talked about even though the situation was appalling, they conducted themselves with dignity and grace. And I thought, isn't there a scripture that talks about preachers? <coughs> and I started to write it off. You can see it in my notes right now in parentheses. I put, let your speech be seen with grace. I said, I want to look it up and find out where that is. And I looked over to the right, and I thought, I'd already done that several weeks ago. Isn't it interesting how you can study the scripture? And you can think of something while you're studying that. Months later, you can be studying the same scripture and the same thoughts come to mind. God is consistent. His word does not change. The world may change. Morals around us may change. The standards of the nation may change. But God's standards remain secure. You can rest in God's grace on that. I mean, if people are always changing, always changing the rules, wouldn't that be awful? You think, man, I finally won. And God says, sorry, change the rules again. <laughs> That would not be grace. Grace is that friendly disposition of the one who gives it. Romans chapter 12 talks about this in verse 8, that when you give, you're to give with liberality. When you lead, lead with diligence. When you show mercy, this is Romans 12 verse 8, if you're going to show mercy to somebody, show it with cheerfulness. That's why I can't help but wonder if Jesus was smiling when he said, you need to do life and then you Go and sin no more. He is more interested in, in her future than he was in what she's done in the past because she was willing to call him Lord. I hope you heard me there. Everybody wants a savior, 
But we need him as Lord first before he can be Savior. The divine favor of grace is given freely. I want to hear this. I carefully penned these words several weeks ago. I preached this sermon around Washington, PA, a little country church in Dutch Fork, Pennsylvania. The pulpit behind which I stood was actually a pulpit where Alexander Campbell from the Restoration Movement stood in the 1800s. He preached the same pulpit. This is a different pulpit. I don't know when this pulpit came here. But it doesn't matter what pulpit you stand behind. What matters is the book from which you read and live. And so here's what I wrote about grace. And I shared it with them. I shared it with you this morning. God's grace, his favor, is freely given. It's given universally. It's given spontaneously. Well, oftentimes when someone will come to us and say, would you forgive me? I need your forgiveness. I beg your pardon. And sometimes we'll say, well, let me think about it. I'll get back with you. I'll get back with you tomorrow. And they don't call. I'll get back with you. And, and, and that's not grace. That's control. It's like it. Because I know you're indebted to me. You indeed have sinned against me. You come to me and beg my pardon. You ask for forgiveness. And I say, let me take it over a bit. You, you do remember what Jesus said about that? That if we want that forgiveness, we must forgive others. It's the only way to be free. Grace is the antithesis of death. I purposely chose that word. Not to confuse people. But it's the opposite of debt. How many of you have uh, ever heard of these debt consolidation companies? Call us. We'll help you with your debt. We'll consolidate it and we'll make it. I remember we tried that one time years and years and years and years ago. I believe the name of the company. And I warned Dutch for it. Don't ever go in this company. Send us all your bills. Send everything you owe. We'll take care of your payments for you. Debt consolidation. I believe it was Gibson. It was a Gibson Trust. I think it was Gibson Trust. We found out later, a few months later, that we started receiving calls from our our creditors, I guess, is that what you call them? Either way, they're the head, the tail. And we haven't received a payment. What? And we, we called Gibson and found out they did not send out any payments, and we ended up deeper in debt than we were. God's grace is not a debt consolidation, it is a debt canceling. Most of us don't know what that means. It'd be like the bank calling you on something you definitely owe with interest. And the bank calls you and says, we paid it off for you. What? <laughs> you, you owe nothing. It is debt cancellation and not debt consolidation. You do understand the difference. When we say, well, I'll get back with you, that's debt consolidation. Debt cancellation given freely, universally, spontaneously, happily. The debt is gone. Yet I'm a debtor. How about you? Any debtors in the room? We are indebted. Paul even himself said he was a debtor. We are indebted to Christ. We are indebted to God who offers this grace, this favor, this debt cancellation. Where Christ enables us to receive his offer of forgiveness with gratitude and joy. Just like in the New Testament conversions. And I turn with you to a few there. At least I do in my notes. And you can turn in your Bible if you so desire. At least keep them in mind. We've got all day, right? We've got eternity. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. In Acts chapter 2, think about the grace that these people received. In Acts 2.37 and following, in Acts 2.37, the people were in a panic. G Peter had just said this, Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made Lord in Christ, and he suddenly realized they had killed their Messiah. These Jewish people that were looking for Messiah for centuries, now understanding, oh, what have we done? And they went into a panic. A panic attack, if you please. And by verse 44, these panic-stricken people were filled with awe. The Bible says all those who believed were together, and all, all things were held in common, and day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, they were breaking bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. This is the true picture of individuals who have gladly received with joyfulness and grace. How do you think that woman went home that day? She knew she was going to die. Well, she thought she was going to die, right? In her standard of things, until grace was introduced into the equation, it overruled all the debt she owed. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. What do you think she did? You think she went and continued in sin? 
You need to read that article by in the bulletin there. I think it's deeper being on offer. It's about cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace doesn't require repentance, doesn't require baptism, doesn't require faithful attendance, doesn't require communion. That's cheap grace. Costly grace does. As we understand it's been a price paid to forgive us of our sin. $4,000 was the price in 1980. It was for a Chevy Chevette. I didn't have the money. Someone said, 4000 bucks for a Chevy Chevette? Are you kidding? An 80,000 mile throwaway car? You and I would make it different. You still have the Chevette. Oh. We got 200,000 miles out of that Chevy Chevette. And our dad, my dad, loaned us $4,000. And then he wouldn't let me pay it back. And then years later, when I learned what principal time rate time time meant with interest, I didn't understand all that stuff at the time. And when I did a math problem on the board illustrating the kids, suppose you have four thousand dollars in the savings account at six percent interest. How many of you know that was the day? And it really was six percent interest in those days. I said, suppose you have four thousand dollars in the bank, principal time rate time time at six percent interest. And by the time I was done figuring the problem, the interest that my dad lost. Just by loaning us the four thousand dollars, brought me to tears. I cannot say, unfortunately, that it taught me the lesson about going into debt. But I hope this little illustration will help understand that it was not with sil silver and gold that our redemption is. Paul and Peter said it was with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It wasn't four thousand dollars that purchased our pardon. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And I hope that we would understand that we do not want to purposely continue to go into debt. The sin against God. By the way, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when these people responded to the message and were baptized, if I don't say this, land is going to stand and say, Don't forget, today is Pentecost. Amen. Today is the day of Pentecost. Today is 50 days after the time of Friday morning when they were saying, Crucify him, crucify him. What shall I do with him? He has done no wrong. And the Jews said, Let his blood be upon our heads and on the heads of our children. We'll talk more about that tonight. Book of Revelation, judgment of God. But here they went from panic stricken to now in awe, and to sharing the message. And the Bible says in Acts 2, verse 47, day by day, the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. These people could say, What a difference you've made in my life. Anybody know who sang that song years ago? What a difference you've made in my life. Never thought you'd hear that song or it's determined with grace. Remember Ronnie Millsap? What a difference you've made in my life. I can't give you the whole song and I won't. I just refuse to torture you like that. But I looked up the words several weeks back. You are my sunshine day and night. And that's why I want to spread the news. Those are the lyrics of that song. And one of the lyrics says, In my heart you replaced all the broken parts. Can't help but wonder if maybe you can sing about Jesus. It's almost as good as the song Stranger in My House. You know what I'm saying? Remember that song, Stranger in My House, Ronnie Millsap? I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. In God's house sometimes there are many strangers that really don't understand the grace. I'm going to show you a video tonight. A four minute clip. It's on my Facebook page, so if you can't be here tonight, go to my Facebook page and see where the minister was talking to the Christians over in China. The Christians in China who were persecuted and put to death for faith, put in prison if they have a Bible, who have memorized scripture. They'll sneak in passages of scripture on pieces of paper to the prisoners. And then it's confiscated, yet they've memorized most of the New Testament and other parts of the Bible. He said, How do you memorize it? He said, They said, When you're in prison, they're going to take it. You have to memorize quickly. And they worship for three hours, by the way. They walk for hours just to get the service. They sit on the ground. There is no air conditioning. And then at the end of the clip, he says this. The Chinese Christians were saying, please pray that we like the Christians in America. He said, I can't do that. I won't do that. He said, for most, if it's an over an hour just to get there, folks won't come. If there's not air conditioning, they won't come. If the service lasts longer than an hour, they won't come. You kind of get the drift. And as I listen to that and kind of combine it with the thoughts of grace, I realize sometimes I'm a stranger. I'm a stranger once you you are too. We don't really understand grace, do we? Well, there would be something different about the way we work and the way we labor. 
like the Apostle Paul who said in the opening scripture, his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored more than all of them, not me, but the grace of God with me. I want to give you this in 2 Timothy 2 1. Don't know from my notes, but that's okay. For sure, something that's not my notes. I do believe. Second Timothy 2 1, I believe it is where the Apostle Paul, in the English language, it says, Be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I appreciate those foot, footnotes in the Bible that lead us to deeper study. It's not because we're more brilliant than anybody else, but it just gives us a more literal rendering of what he meant when he said that. The rendering of that literally is not for you. Hey, I want you to be strong in the grace. No, actually what he said was, more accurately what he said was, be enabled by the grace of God. And you see the difference. If I'm being strong in the grace of God, it's all about me. But if I'm being enabled by the grace of God, it's all about him. That's why I'm not a reverend. Because only God is reverend. Awesome. He's able to save and only God will hand out creation universally, spontaneously, freely. That's not my nature. It's not my nature to do that. <laughs> but as we become more like Christ, we can do as the Romans chapter 12 passage says, show mercy with cheerfulness. When you show mercy with cheerfulness, loved ones, it's different than when we show mercy and then say, I'm forgive you, Lord. I'm not going to forget this happened. That's not grace. That's not forgiveness. In Acts 8, there's another beautiful illustration of God's grace in action where there is an Ethiopian who is confused. He doesn't know and understand what he's reading. And so Philip, as he joins the Ethiopian in the chariot in Acts chapter 8, begins to preach unto him Jesus from the Old Testament passage of Isaiah chapter 53. He reveals undoubtedly to this Ethiopian the suffering Messiah who by the grace of God tasted death for everyone. Yes, that's Hebrews 2 verse 9. By the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Aren't you glad? Because it was just for the Jews, we'd all be going to hell right now unless there's someone here who's Jewish. So by the grace of God, he tasted death. And as they're going along, the Ethiopian said, Look, water! What prevents me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. You know the count. I hope you do. They both went down to the water. Philip baptized the Ethiopian. And this confused, searching, lost individual went to rejoicing because he was found. And I have no doubt when he returned home, <coughs> spread the news to everyone. One final passage in Acts chapter 16. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will. We're going to take a look at this final passage this morning on the beauty of God's grace and the type of individuals that he has come to save. You can read other passages where it talks about all types of wicked, vile individuals like the church at Corinth that was filled with what we would consider, I guess, wicked and vile. In other words, people just like us. The fornicators, the adulterers, the, the abandoned, the sexual perverts, the extortioners, I'd be like G.A.R. Ewing on a series Dallas years ago. I haven't watched that series, but he was a jerk. He was a criminal. He was an extortioner. And Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, says, Such were some of you which were washed, justified, and sanctified. Homosexuals also were included in that group. And the Bible says that once they were baptized in Jesus Christ, they went and sinned no more. They were forgiven, canceled. The dead, not consolidated. In Acts chapter 16, there's one other individual that we might consider wicked and vile as a police officer. Yeah. Police officer. Well, not actually a police officer. He was a jailer. He was in charge of the jail, keeping the prisoners alive. Remember, Paul and Silas were in prison and they were singing around midnight praises to the God. There was an earthquake and the prison doors were open. The jailer thought everybody had escaped. And back in that day, if you didn't do your job, you didn't get. You didn't get fired to draw unemployment. They killed you, and your wife received life insurance. Maybe. He thought he was dead for sure. He thought his prisoners were gone. Paul and Silas said, Do yourself, do, do yourself no harm. We're all here. He asked them a question in verse 30. He says, What must I do to be saved? This is a great passage to take people when they're asking you, What must I do to be saved? Now, there's something I need to teach you, if, if I need to teach you, about grammar. And it's the word and, believe it or not, I think that word was mentioned in Sunday school, ironically. The word and is a conjunction. 
And how many of you know that when he's trying, if you're talking, my mom could do this. She could talk for hours without taking a breath, and she would say something else. And she would, now somehow she was able to breathe when she said and. Have you ever experienced that with someone? And a lot of times, the denominational world will take this passage, and we won't. Because they take it and abuse it, and all they do is focus on verse 31. Where Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And your household may stop right there. Just believe. But you'll notice the very next word is and, which means there should not be a period at the end of verse number one. By the way, in the original Greek, there were, there were you didn't have all those periods and everything, so I'm not tearing down the word of God. So come down here and say, oh, our Bibles aren't trustworthy. Yes, they are. You just do a little study. And so understand there's no there's no. So let's just, let's just let's read the sentence. I'm just going to read a sentence. One sentence. Beginning in 31. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you be saved in your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all those who were in his house. What's the next word? And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and his household. What's the next word? And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly. They have believed in God and the whole household. So verse 31, when it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to read all the way to verse 34 to understand what true belief is. You follow? And this poor pagan jailer, along with all his household, that were lost and lost could be at midnight by 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, were saved on their way to heaven. They came together and had a great meal of rejoicing. Isn't that beautiful? God's grace. You say, oh, that's great. I, I believe it. I believe it. You believe it for those 3,000 people? I sure do. You believe that Ethiopian is going to heaven? I sure do. Absolutely. You believe that jail and his family is going to heaven, providing their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? I sure do. They're going to hear the words, well done. How about you? You believe it for you. That's the real question this morning. To embrace God's grace, it's more difficult than just talking about it. How many of you would like to extend God's grace to others? How many? Would you like to see other people receive God's grace? Right? You can't extend it if you don't have it. If you don't embrace it, you'll never be able to extend it. You cannot get what you do not have. You cannot. I want others to have peace. You have peace? I want others to have peace. I want others to have peace. Have <laughs> Give us that look again, Bo. Oh, I want to do that. <laughs> you can't give it if you don't have it. And I know a lot of folks out in the world following false religions that seem to have it, but they're not keeping the commands of Christ. Oh, I'd much love to see the church who has the commands of Christ, who have them baptized, would also understand they have God's forgiveness, they have God's grace. It is not, it is not, here's what it is well done. Good and faithful servant. It is not. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master as soon as you pay six thousand six hundred and sixty six payments of sixty six dollars and sixty six cents each. As soon as you get that all paid, then we'll let you in. Dude, <laughs> that's not the way it is. You'll be able to stand up for him blameless with great joy. Now, go in with save you, you sound with save you at the time. Matthew chapter 20. Okay? Just don't want you worrying about it anymore. You know, we're going to sing. I love you. You know that. Thank you for the grace you showed me last week. You could have walked up to me last week and said, Get over it, me. You know he's in heaven. But you didn't. You sent me cards. You sent my family cards. Some of you hand me a $20 bill here and there to help with gasoline along the way. I thank you for that grace. That was an act of grace. You didn't have to do that. You know that. And that's what I love about God's grace. You didn't have to. It wasn't like we cornered God into a position where he asked to forgive us. Hey, God, you've got to forgive us. It's not like he was in the corner up against the wall having to do something. He didn't have to do anything, did he? And yet he took his only beloved son in Genesis 3.15 where he promised the servant that the, that the son of the woman who crushed the serpent's head in John 3.16 to where for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that 
Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who watch the roads of the day and have the light of the tree of life and have the light to walk into the city. We have the light by God's grace. In Matthew chapter 20, I, this came to me this morning before I left home. And I believe it was, it was the providence of God that it just came out of nowhere. It, Ron, when you mentioned first be last, last be first, even as you said it, I thought, and it probably had something to do with what you were saying, but I thought, to me, it had nothing to do with what you were saying, but God, God wanted me to leave you all here. Do you remember the account where the kingdom of heaven is compared to a landowner who went out early in the morning and hired some workers to work in the vineyard, and he agreed to give them all a day's wage to denarius? In verse 3 of the third hour, he sees others standing idle. Later in the day, he comes across some more in verse 5, 6, and ninth hour. They're just standing, and he hires them. And then around the 11th hour, he hires some more, and at the 12th hour, they're done. And then when they go to get paid, the ones who'd only worked for an hour, they got paid a full day's wage. And the ones who'd been working all day, they were thinking, hey, we'll get paid more. <laughs> But when it got to them, they got paid the same amount. It's like, what? I don't understand. And uh, Jesus is trying to teach the last are going to be first, the first will be last. In other words, as long as you're in God's vineyard doing God's work, it doesn't matter when you got started. Even if you get started and die 10 minutes later, you still get the same payment. We turn a life. God's grace. Now, which one of us is going to be dumb enough to stand up and say, that ain't work? In case there is anybody, I don't think there is anyone here, but I want you to notice in verse 4, here's the lesson I learned on grace. Verse 4. You go in the vineyard and work, and whatever is right, I will give you. It's the first time I've ever made a statement publicly about God's grace in this regard. I've never made this statement before. When we receive God's grace, because we have honored his terms, his commands, he gives us what's right. I'm telling you, it is right for God to give us his grace. You know why I can say that? Because Jesus did it. Jesus says, I will give you what is right. And he's chosen to give us grace. Now, does anybody still want to argue with God? Say, I'm going to do well, by your own merit, of course not, but because of Jesus Christ, you are. So could we walk out with confidence, please, today? You quit wallowing in the sins of the past. Now, if it's the sins of the present, and you're still continuing, it needs to stop. I understand that, but if it's the sins of the past, let the past be the past. And accept his forgiveness. Enjoy his forgiveness. You won't have to be afraid again. Of entering into his presence. Does anybody know? Anybody know who needs this? Anybody know who needs this? The very first word of our song gives the answer to that question. Everyone. <coughs> Let's stand. Let's see. Who needs this? Everyone. Me included. <laughs> Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of the Savior. The Holy God of nature. Savior, he can prove the mountain. My God is mighty to say. He is mighty to stay for After of salvation, he knows he conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. 
Yes. 